Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, or whenever this is going out. I think it's going out in the afternoon, actually. Uh, my name's Simon Diwali, and I'm the Principal Highways Engineer for um, Bradford Council. Um, and I've been asked to um, to look at this um, particular aspect of uh, um, uh, addressing inequality in health through road safety and active travel. Um, it's something I've been working on for a long time and some uh, something I, I've looked at with um, uh, uh, some of the panel members in the past, uh, for instance, I worked with Nicola Christie some um, 16, 17 years ago on a very similar project um, to what I'm about to show you now. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you to PAX for uh, allowing me to uh, present. OK. So just some facts about Bradford itself, um, uh, five, population of 540,000, uh, fourth largest metropolitan district in the UK. Um, ethnic makeup, um, we're, we're at 67.44% um, uh, white and uh, the remainder of that is made up of uh, um, uh, minority ethnic um, groups um, of varying sizes. Um, that will become um, a relevant piece of information further in the presentation. I won't, I won't talk about it now though. What is interesting is that uh, uh, myself and my colleagues are responsible for 1,200 miles worth of road, but only 30 miles of those has any cycling infrastructure at all. I don't know who that gentleman is. I just uh, downloaded some random picture from the internet, but uh, very smart. Uh, I like his bike as well. That's quite good. Um, so in terms of... Um, What's happened with the world, COVID-19 and transport, um, things have, have, have rapidly changed for the UK. The crisis has made us have a little think about what's going on with transportation. We know through the, the lockdown that general car trips have been reduced, uh, bus rail patronage severely down uh, at, in some places 10 and 15% which is creeping up now, obviously right at the end of lockdown periods, but there are still areas and people have concerns where, where they're, not they're not taking up the public transport again. There has been a huge surge in walking and cycling, as we know, and employers are just having a little think about what, what to do. They've made the pandemic work for them, uh, and employees are saying, well, do we actually need accommodation? Do we need to bring people in? Do we need to generate that trip? So there has been a, dra a dramatic rethink about um, uh, what's going on. Although if you look out of your window now, um, I bet most of you would probably say, you know, where's it gone? You know, are we, uh, the, the, the roads look pretty normal to me. I think what's happened is we've got extended periods of, of peak now. Uh, um, and that's to do with flexible working as well. So there are the travel patterns are different. We do we do recognise that. And the result is um, we've got um, a, an increase in cycle injuries in the UK. Um, uh, this headline came through to me this week, and and we know ourselves in West Yorkshire where we are. Um, vulnerable user groups are, are on the increase, partly to do with the um, uh, the quieter roads and the propensity for um, some motorists to speed. And then obviously we, we know that there is an, an uptake in uh, um, uh, differing uh, transport modes such as walking and cycling uh, and more um, record numbers of people are doing that these days. And clearly that's going to lead to a conflict uh, at some point. And unfortunately, the cyclists and the pedestrians are the ones that are paying the price for that. Um, from this, we've also discovered that um, we have created inadvertently a transport poverty. Uh, that, now, that's a term that's only come to me in the last few months, transport poverty. Um, uh, um, and clearly there are, um, there are parts of metropolitan districts that are suffering more than most. And um, the more deprived parts of, uh, of inner cities uh, are experiencing this transport poverty where we've got low car use um, and there is no viable alternative for them. So obviously there is a, a need to examine what these challenges are and, and that's what we've done. Um, it makes access to employment and retail um, services 
difficult for some people. Um, so what do we do? Let's have a look. Um, it would be remiss of me not to mention my colleague, uh, um, Alex Hurd, who's provided this amazing data for us in, in Bradford. Um, Alex works in our transport planning team and has put together um, uh, some extremely useful data for us to uh, um, to think about. And this first map is showing a, a heat map of um, a bus mode share. And we can see um, the the darker areas that are, are focused around the um, the inner cities of Bradford and its surrounding borders. Um, and some darker patches um, further above that in uh, the Keighley district as well. Uh, and these are this is where public transport um, is is a, is taken up the most in Bradford. Um, and these also correlate to the um, uh, some of the poorest parts of the country, uh, which are actually in the top five and ten percent most deprived super output areas in the UK. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, uh, showing where we have um, uh, non-motorised household share. And we can see the, the previous map mirrors that as well, um, uh, almost exactly, with um, low car ownership in the inner, inner conurbations um, all the way through to, uh, to Keithley in the darker, uh, those darker patches just, in, um, just above the middle of the district there. This third map is a um, transport inequality um, and it takes into account bus use, car ownership and whether the residents themselves walk to work um, with the again, um, you could put all three maps together and they would they would just basically overlap one another. Uh, and we can see that um, uh, um, the, the, the biggest problems are in the um, inner city conurbations uh, and the, the most, the poorer parts of the district, not necessarily in the rural areas. So with that information, we then went ahead and uh, developed an online survey portal. Um, I think some of you will know it as commonplace uh, or some similar um, portal. And we found this to be an extremely useful tool for engagement. Uh, and you can see there we, we received 450 um, respondents in three weeks, which is um, which is quite extraordinary. And uh, basically what it allowed them to do was um, pick a node on a map and then each one of those nodes had some attributes where you would make some comments about what you'd like to see or what was um, uh, uh, something that you would feel would be of benefit to either you or a group of you or uh, the general area uh, and the uh, the results of which you can see just above and uh, a lot of them are focused around um, cycle lane provision and walking um, just just under half of the respondents um, focused on that with uh, a smattering of other things like traffic calming and uh, parking restrictions in certain areas and things like that but the majority will um, have kind of pointed towards active travel um, measures and we, we found this um, uh, incredibly useful for us um, to extract some ex um, really good nuanced detail for the district that we wouldn't necessarily know ourselves. These are the people that live there 24 seven. And, and what we found was um, a real um, strong feeling towards active travel when this, when this survey um, went live. And what this also gave us uh, yeah, was um, confidence from political quarters that that whatever we did, as long as we we kind of had that um, engagement and we and we looked at the detail and the work was feasible, um, we would receive political support for these programs. So that was a big plus. So so from all that data collection, we basically developed um, uh, priorities and what we what we can see here is uh, the higher level priorities. Uh, it was very, very clear to us that that's this creation of transport poverty. We could we could quickly address that with a mixture of training and physical measures as well. And um, obviously what we what we don't want to do is simply go in on corridors, build 
lots of cycle infrastructure and nobody use it or everyone's afraid to use it. Uh, and so um, road space reallocation became um, a clear focus for us um, on, on the major corridors into the city centre uh, and, um, and parts of the Keighley area as well. And uh, every corridor into Bradford now actually has some physical measure. The only one that doesn't is is, is um, Thornton Road, uh, as I think then, uh, and that's coming in the um, uh, the Transforming Cities Fund at some point in the future. So we're just holding off a little while for that one. But uh, everywhere else, you'll you'll find that if you come into Bradford, you'll see some uh, some major transformations to the um, to the network. And just some of the things that we've done um, already today. So you can see the um, the pop up cycle lane right in the centre of uh, of Bradford. There, um, that's on Hollings. Um, a cycle hub in in Ilkley, which was well received by the cycle community. Ilkley Cycling Club is actually one of the largest in the UK. Um, and with that hub, and um, we've actually um, we've installed a, a pump and a uh, um, a tool station. Um, for use for cyclists as well. It's a really um, a really good feature, and obviously they can they can. It's got it's got a good cycle storage and somewhere to sit and have a bite to eat on your journey. And that bottom picture shows um, some of the cycle racks we've installed um, at every single council car park in the district. So every every council owned car park now has got secure cycle um, uh, storage now which is um which is a big plus that's something that was asked for for um has been asked for for many years yeah so just going down the list there pop-up cycle lanes that's that's uh, of which we've installed quite a number secure cycle storage footpath extensions um routes to school i'll come on to that onto the next slide school streets um that the rollout of that has actually started on monday um of this week uh, and we are just monitoring it and seeing what's happened and we've we've basically closed streets to um all traffic now outside school um 10 pilot schools uh in in the district and we're we're just waiting to see what happens um uh it's uh, it's going to be interesting uh, there was there was good support for this um uh politically um what will the parents think? Well, let's let's find out. Um, but it means that, that the, the children are actually getting some ability to walk at some point in the daytime. That's the idea. But obviously what we've got to be careful of is creating parking areas beyond where they were before. So that is something we're having to monitor at this time. Uh, um, and very importantly, the environment is uh, uh, is. is the, the the way people travel in terms of speed is important to us and obviously 20 mile an hour um uh, schemes are being rolled out across the entirety of the uh, the district now and we started with the city center first and we're rolling on to um the smaller conurbations around bradford now um so, such as shipley um that's been done uh, bingley's next and ilkley's now on the cards as well and with that, we're also providing 20 mile an hour um, schemes outside schools. So that's uh, that's an ongoing program that we've agreed with the political leadership that we would do. Um, and then the low traffic neighborhoods, um, that's something um, we haven't examined before. And our pilot schemes are, are being developed now for Saltaire and other parts of the district. So let's um, watch this space, there might be new New news in the near future. Uh, the Scotchman Road scheme we've got there, um, that, that's a, a very, very positive one. And I've worked with Sarah Alley in the Landscape Architects team on, on this and um, a programme called Jump um, to get this off the ground. And it incentivises children to walk to school in a, in a, a, a very deprived part of the city. Uh, and what we've done is provide pass through this uh, this parked area um, and play equipment. So we, we're kind of um, we're hitting them twofold. We're, we're, we're wanting the children to to walk um, and then have a little play um, on the way to school, on the way back 
as well. So it kind of gives them that exercise. We're hitting all those public health agendas um, that are, are so needed, you know, um, children being in sedentary positions for such long periods now. Let's get them out walking. And we've engaged with our public health partners um, many times over the years over and, 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 and collaborated on schemes such as this across the whole of the district. Uh, the footpath extensions, uh, we've done uh, many of these now. Some of these are more um, pointing towards uh, the livability, um, removal of parking and providing seating areas and social distancing outside for restaurants and cafes and the like. But we've also looked at routes to school where, where footpaths are required in constrained areas to, to ensure that there is the confidence for the, um, these children to then um, to use them and not having to walk into the road. And we've done several of those schemes in the last 12 months. And this last one here, the, the pop-up cycle lane on Wakefield Road. This is actually a 40 mile an hour major corridor into the into Bradford city centre. And no one would have believed we would have done this, certainly not 12 months ago. And now look at us, we've, we've, we've put in a, um, a good mile stretch of um, a segregated cycle lane all the way into the city centre now. Um, it's a real uh, bonus for us. Constrained traffic into two lanes. Are there delays? They probably are, um, but they're not insurmountable. Uh, and uh, at what cost? You know, we're, we're basically providing safe cycle passage um, along that corridor. Um, and I've just listed there some of the areas where we've uh, um, uh, um, received the funding for some of these elements. OK, we need to keep these going. Uh, uh, and um, the one thing I've um, I've learned um, w when I was working on the obesity agenda for Bradford Council, uh, we, we developed a whole systems approach um, is that you you don't know um, where uh, um, the benefit could be and what department would may provide some some support or, or um, cohesion to uh, to making things happen. And uh, wh when I was working on that, you know, we will we will trying to overcome. Or, or, or look at problems around cultural norms that have occurred for, for hundreds of years. And certainly with the obesity agenda, we were looking at um, the use of ghee and what the uh, in, in, in cooking and, and, and what the alternatives were. How do we as an agency um, uh, deal with that? And it's, it's something similar here with cycling among certain communities. You know, if, if 30 percent of our communities are, are Asian population, um, the the cycle is seen as a poor man's transport and it's overcoming those those barriers to see what the benefit is to them. Can we can we get that across to to some parts of the community? And that's led us to do um, wider engagement with communities on this um, subject to provide um, cycle training and work with other agencies that have better knowledge of this um, where we can we can get into the community and, and try and understand what the um, what these problems are and try and overcome them um, show them what the benefits are of walking and cycling and 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 dealing with it in, a, on uh, on a direct basis and um, and so that's what we're up to now. And uh, I won't provide the detail here, but if anybody wanted to uh, engage me afterwards, then uh, I'm quite willing to share the information. Um, and the cycle training that we're doing just goes beyond things like bikeability. We're, we're talking about providing adult cycle training as well and, and helping um, other others, you know, access to bikes, access to free bikes. We're working with um, agencies such as Capital for Cycling which is a charity that, that is um, um, uh, in, in Bradford that provides um, uh, free cycles for um, hard to reach groups and, 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 and people on uh, uh, NHS workers and things like that. And um, we, we see that as an absolute plus uh, to, um, to work with these agencies. Um, another barrier for us has been the maintenance of all this new infrastructure. Um, uh, with the maintenance budgets that we currently um, carry, um, we're finding it's more and more difficult to maintain any new infrastructure and 
the budgets that have been provided from the top from Whitehall, um, it, it, they're great at providing the um, the money to, uh, to to install this. But um, where's the support for maintaining some of this? And and what we're finding in some parts of the district is that that cycle lanes aren't actually used, and their cycle cyclists are cycling on the outside of the lane. Um, I'm only raising this as a point of concern because obviously I'm an engineer working on the delivery of these programs, and I'm I'm aware of these these particular problems uh, um, uh, that that uh, I know other authorities are facing as well. So we would like the ability to be able to maintain this new infrastructure and, and we haven't exactly bottomed out how that's going to be paid for, um, but it needs to be done um, uh, along with support from our enforcement agencies as well to provide the necessary um, uh, roads policing presence on the network to make sure that, that, that um, uh, people are abiding by the law. Um, and so we do have regular discussions with the police on on, on matters of enforcement in, in parts of the district. Um, and we get, um, and we've got great engagement there with, the, with West Yorkshire Police on that matter as well. Um, if we put all that together and we get, we tick all those boxes, you will then get that political support um, and that's the one thing we do have in Bradford is strong political leadership for active travel. Um, uh, if we if they've got the confidence um, uh, that that things are working, people aren't being injured, uh, um, the the support is there, the measures are going in, then they will continue to um, um, support active travel. And and what you'll find, and what we are finding is. Um, the support can wane if if one or two things happen. You know, if if there are any high profile injuries or incidents, uh, um, and we've seen it across the UK where there are certain measures have been taken out. And you know, it, whilst I think that's a backward step, you can understand the reasoning why um, uh, some politicians would then um, lose uh, um, support for that. Uh, you know, because it's a difficult thing to to argue for if people are being injured. And uh, or maybe the dynamics of why they've been injured isn't fully understood at the time. I don't know, but but we have seen some um, some large schemes being taken out. We we are, we haven't re reached that point in West Yorkshire yet, um, and hopefully we can we can keep that going forward and make some of these permanent. As I've said there. We do need to do strong monitoring and evaluation here. You know, we're, we're talking about accessing hard to reach groups um, and communities. And, and because of that, it's um, it's easy just to put measures in and then not go back and understand who's who's using it. Are they using it at all? Have they got the right support? Uh, and, and that's where um, the council as an agency needs to um, to be. Uh, we need to be mindful of that um, and um, pick up the pieces if um, if things are failing. Look at the accidents. Let's make sure that that they, we're we're on the downward trend. You know, I mean, those headlines that you saw at the start of the slide, it's not good to see at all. Um, I don't know if the rate of injuries up um, at this moment in time in the UK. That would be interesting to know. We do, we do know there are more cyclists, so the exposure risk is greater. Is uh, and nobody wants um, any accidents at all, but um, I'd be interested to know what the rate of injury is, uh, um, and uh, and and let's sustain that training. The training is very very important. Uh, we we must recognise there are all different um, skill sets on the network. Some cyclists are, are, are just coming to the network for the very first time. Some coming back from a long hiatus, um, and and so the skill set is different. And our measures have got to be reflective of that. Your average commuter. Um, like a wearing um, uh, um, super cyclist uh, on a on a thousand pound, two thousand, three thousand pound bike, um, doesn't necessarily want to have segregated cycle facilities, but he just wants to know he 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 wants to be safe on the network um, uh, at some point so he can do his thing safely. Whereas the less experienced cyclist, uh, you know, we need to incentivize them to get out there and try it. So a segregated facility is of absolute paramount importance. And maybe out of all this, the pop up cycle lanes and the other measures that we're doing could become permanent. Who knows? I hope so. And uh, that's me done. Thank you very much.